we all read Poe when we're young, and he just blows us away, everybody. Uh, and then we don't read him again, but we should. There's something very familiar and contemporary with Edgar Allan Poe. He doesn't quite seem as distant to us as I think as some other better known people from that period of time, uh, because we see in him something of us. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore. Poe, uh, in a sense, uh, defined the forms uh, of uh, fiction uh, and poetry and, and criticism very early in our cultural history. Uh, in fact, one could argue that uh, American literature and world literature have not been the same since Poe. He was a genius. He did not think the way other people thought. He had inner workings in his mind that were just so incredibly intricate and different. He even wrote a poem called Alone, where he says, I am not as others were, I have not seen as others saw. Well, one thing that's true uh, about Poe is that he has been in print ever since he lived. There have always been uh, paperback collections, inexpensive editions of his work. Why? Because people buy them and they read them. Not because professors tell them to not because the academic institutions support his reputation. And we have to remember that it wasn't until about the mid 20th century that Poe was accepted as a major American writer. He was pushed into the bin of popular culture. He wrote horror stories, science fiction, stuff like that. And he does not belong over here with the major figures, Hawthorne and Melville, people like that. He's kind of pushed over to the side. One, because not a whole lot is known about him factually. But two, he's controversial, even today. People are still talking about Poe today because they're still reading him. And they're still reading him because he developed a lot of the literary genres that are the most popular ones today, like the detective story and science fiction and the tale of psychological horror. But even more than his fiction, his story of his life has really captivated millions of people. And the longer he's been dead, the more trouble he's gotten into, the more legends grow up around him. He wasn't just some solitary character shuttered up in a garret. Uh, writing these gruesome stories about his tortured consciousness. There is some truth to that, but that's not the whole picture, that's not the whole poem. Born into a world of drama, Edgar Poe began his rambling journey through life in Boston, Massachusetts, January 19, 1809. His parents, stage actors Eliza and David Poe, had been married at the Henrico County Courthouse in Richmond during a previous tour. For the most wild, yet most homely narrative which I am about to pen, I neither expect nor solicit belief. Mad indeed would I be to expect it, in a case where my very senses reject their own evidence. Yet, mad am I not, and very surely do I not dream. But tomorrow I die, and today I would unburthen my soul. The talented Eliza Poe was performing in Richmond at the time of her death. The cause? Tuberculosis. Her husband had already left Eliza with Edgar, his brother, and a sister on the way, all of whom were separated after Eliza's death. Not yet three years old, Edgar was taken in by John and Francis Allen. Except for a five-year stay with the Allens in England, Poe would spend his childhood and adolescence in Richmond. Well, Richmond was Poe's hometown. He spent more of his life here than he spent in any other city. And even when he moved up north to the big cities of New York or Philadelphia, he always considered himself a Virginian and a Virginia gentleman. And Richmond is where he started his literary career, but also where he started as a boy of two years old. He was taken in by the Allen family. He had his first loves here. By the age of 13, he already wanted to publish his first book of poetry. He grew up in the era when the great romantics were getting their start, Keats, Byron. He, he idolized Byron. He loved every aspect of Byron's life. Lord Byron, the English poet with a reputation of being mad, bad, and dangerous to know, embodied the rebel image that young Eddie developed a penchant for and would eventually grow into. He was, however, an athletic and intellectually gifted child who fished and swam in the James, attended services at Monumental Church on Broad Street, and was a lieutenant in the Richmond Junior Volunteers. It was with this group that the young Poe escorted French General Lafayette on his 1824 visit to Richmond, which was a much different place than we see today. 
when you're looking at Richmond of Poe's time, you have to mentally erase all of the high-rise office towers, make the high-tension lines vanish, and uh, get rid of the street lamps. And imagine, too, that and understand that Richmond during Poe's lifetime was, uh, uh, had a population of about 16 to 20,000 people living in what looks like in some pictures in, in watercolors, a rather picturesque village um, rambling along these undulant hillsides alongside the sensual curve of the Great James River. The city was changing so drastically in the early 1800s. It um, was part of the Industrial Revolution. It was going from a very agricultural city, mostly plantation-based, mostly tobacco. A um, little bit of cotton, a little bit of flour here and there around the city, but mostly tobacco, to a very heavily industrial city. Tredegar Ironworks got its start um, during Poe's lifetime while he was here in, in Richmond. So he was seeing that um, bustling change happen. When we talk about Richmond uh, as an influence to him, um, you really kind of have to think about the people that he was involved with here in the city of Richmond. One Richmonder who inspired his early poetry was Jane Stannard, the mother of one of his classmates, Robert Stannard. At 14, Poe was smitten. Soon thereafter, Jane Stannard, then 30 years old, died of a possible brain tumor furthering a motif of loss that would haunt Poe throughout his life. He thought of Stannard as Helen of Troy and later immortalized her beauty in verse. Helen, thy beauty is to me like those Nicene box of yore that wafting o'er a perfumed sea the weary wayward wanderer bore to his own native shore. On desperate seas, long wont to roam, thy hyacinth hair, thy classic face. Thy naiad airs have brought me home to the glory that was Greece and the grandeur that was Rome. Poe fell in love again, this time with a seemingly more attainable Elmira Royster, and was secretly engaged before heading off to the University of Virginia, then in its second academic session. Poe went to UVA with a bunch of, uh, of, of rich gentlemen's sons, and, and his, quote, father, Alan, was a rich gentleman too. Uh, the difference was he was a skinflint. He didn't want to give Poe any money anyway. John Allen basically felt, well, listen, nobody helped me to, make, to, to be a self-made man, and it's high time that this kid learned some, self, some responsibility. So I'll just send him to UVA without enough money. And Poe always had a great sense of pride. Um, he probably would have had it no matter how he grew up. It was probably partly genetic. But he also was raised in the Allen home to think of himself as a, as a, a young Virginia gentleman and then all of a sudden finding out that's not, not my future. Poe's basic interests weren't Allen's interests. This guy was obviously an artsy, kind of a philosophical poet type and Allen was, was a, a uh, very hard-headed uh, businessman uh, with no, no sense of, of the romantic at all, as far as I can tell. Though he excelled academically, Edgar could not cover his expenses and incurred massive gambling debt. Unable to continue his studies, he returned to the increasingly inhospitable Allen home, Moldavia, at Fifth and Main. The year was 1827, and Francis Allen, who had mothered the orphan Poe, was slowly dying. To add to the volatility, his engagement to Elmira had been sabotaged by her parents while he was away. And when he came home, he had a vision of just becoming a poet. And to him, being a poet meant like being a rock star today, with traveling around and having a good time and really living life and experiencing adventures. But when he got home from college, his foster father put him to work as an accountant in his firm and they quarreled so much, so violently, that after just a few months in that firm, Poe took off. Sir, after my treatment on yesterday and what passed between us this morning, I can hardly think that you will be surprised at the contents of this letter. My determination is at length taken to leave your house and endeavor to find some place in this wide world where I will be treated not as you have treated me. This is not a hurried determination, but one on which I have long considered. 
and having so considered, my resolution is unalterable. You may perhaps think that I have flown off in a passion, and that I am already wishing to return, but not so. I'll give you the reasons which have actuated me, and then judge. I really think that that was the major turning point in his life, where he had to uh, embrace a way to make a living. Poe made his way to Boston, where he enlisted in the U.S. Army under the name Edgar A. Perry. It was there that he published his first book of poetry, Tamerlane and Other Poems. He excelled in his military career, rose in rank quickly, but found his passion for writing incompatible with military life. He was accepted to West Point, but financial problems continued to plague him. You sent me to West Point like a beggar. The same difficulties are threatening me as before at Charlottesville, and I must resign. With an intentional expulsion, Poe departed for Baltimore, where he moved in with his aunt, Mariah, or Muddy Clem, and her daughter, Virginia. Destitute, he continued to pursue a literary career while begging John Allen for assistance. Baltimore, December 29th, 1831. Dear Sir, Nothing but extreme misery and distress would make me venture to intrude myself again upon your notice. If you knew how wretched I am, I am sure that you would relieve me. No person in the world, I am sure, could have undergone more wretchedness than I have done for some time past. And I have indeed no friend to look to but yourself, and no chance of extricating myself without your assistance. I know that I have no claim upon your generosity, and that what little share I had of your affection is long since forfeited. But for the sake of what was once dear to you, for the sake of the love you bore me when I sat upon your knee and called you father, do not forsake me this only time. And God will remember you accordingly. E.A. Poe. And one curious thing about um, Edgar Poe is that middle name, Allen was never his middle name. He was never formally adopted by the Allens. There was no legal transfer, but he just, I believe, liked the euphony. He liked the way it sounded. Edgar, Allen, Poe, it almost sounds like a heartbeat. Arthur Gordon Pym, the same thing. It's, it's that dun 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 He liked the way it sounded. Um, he also felt like it gave him a, a kind of connection to that family and that whole aspect of wealth that he felt was denied him. I think right there is a crucial understanding of who Edgar Allan Poe was, that even his middle name was not quite a fiction and not quite true. <laughs> it was a little bit true and a little bit false. My immediate purpose is to place before the world, plainly, succinctly, and without comment, a series of mere household events. In their consequences, these events have terrified, have tortured, have destroyed me yet I will not attempt to expound them. To me, they have presented little but horror. Well, Poe seems to invent a lot of his life story partially as a joke and partially for purposes of publicity. He said that to be appreciated, you must be read. So he realized that nobody's gonna read his works, nobody's gonna appreciate his works unless they notice him. So he really was interested in negative publicity. In 1833, Poe made the last of his many pleas of desperation to John Allen, again, to no avail. If you will only consider in what a situation I am placed, you will surely pity me. Without friends, without any means, consequently of obtaining employment, I am perishing, absolutely perishing for want of aid. Yet I am not idle, nor addicted to any vice, nor have I committed any offense against society which would render me deserving of so hard a fate. For God's sake, pity me and save me from destruction. Poe is a person who is trying to better himself. He's trying to move up through social strata. Uh, and this is certainly something that many people in the contemporary United States can, can understand because we're all trying to get ahead a little bit. And Poe, who perhaps thought he should have inherited all this money from John Allen, who got not one red cent from him and spent the rest of his life trying to, to, to make a living. The only way he knew how, by writing. Having gained attention with his short story manuscript found in a bottle, opportunity knocked in Richmond. 
In 1834, he joined the editorial staff of Thomas White's Southern Literary Messenger at 15th and Main. The Southern Journalistic Society was very fledgling. In fact, when he came to the Southern Literary Messenger, he was told by White that he wanted, White wanted to create this sort of Southern periodical of, of merit. There was no such thing in the culture. So when he brought Poe on, he told him he wanted to further that idea that the South has artists and writers just like the North does. So Poe came on, he started writing for um, White at the Messenger. He helped to build the Messenger up into the foremost Southern periodical probably in the history of the South. And Poe got the ball rolling on that. He also started, you know, spanning between the North and the South with his criticisms. He made his reputation as a savage book reviewer, um, and people called him the Tomahawk Man uh, all across the country. If you heard Poe was reviewing your book, you, you were very worried. At age 27, Poe married his first cousin, Virginia. Though she attested to being 21 years old, she was actually 13. When he married uh, Virginia Clem, he was also marrying Mariah Clem as a mother figure. He was, what he was trying to do is get a family, since he'd been thrown out of his family. It was many and many a year ago in a kingdom by the sea that a maiden there lived, whom you may know, by the name of Annabel Lee. And this maiden, she lived with no other thought than to love and be loved by me. I was a child, and she was a child in this kingdom by the sea. But we loved with a love that was more than love, I and my Annabelle Lee. Poe's reputation began to spread based on his talent as well as his character flaws, some real, some perceived, all exaggerated. People in Richmond did know who he was, may not have approved of what he did, or may not have read what he wrote. That's another thing, too. You know, they, oh, that Poe, I don't know. He writes those weird stories, and they, I hear he drinks a little. <laughs> you know, it's gossipy, gossipy little town. He really could not handle his alcohol, so after a glass of wine, he was staggering drunk. And he did develop this reputation as being a drunkard because people would see him in public and see him drunk and think he'd been having a whole lot more than he actually had and not realize it was only one glass. But his writing was done when he wasn't drinking, when he was in a good state of mind, when he was very calm. You can see his handwriting, how controlled it is, and how precise. And when you read his poetry, you see this mathematical rhythm, all the calculations he must have done to get the meter and the rhyme and everything just perfect. And he's slaved to this poetry. And he devoted that much attention to his short stories as well. The writing of a piece of fiction, a poem, a play, a novel, a piece of music, they're carefully constructed uh, materials. They, they don't come through some kind of magical inspiration, the way the romantic poets wanted people to believe. He wanted you to know that writing is hard work. And not only that, you have to do it very carefully. And you have to take into account the impact it has on the reader. Despite his success at The Messenger, his drinking led to conflict with Mr. White that resulted in Poe leaving after 18 months' employment. And for the next several years, we really don't know what he was doing. He was leading his gypsy life with his wife and his mother-in-law up and down the East Coast looking for work. After a brief stint in New York, the family moved to Philadelphia, where he again found work as a magazine editor and published his first and only novel, The Narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym. His years in Philadelphia were incredibly prolific. His talent, however, was disproportionate to his ability to earn a living. Poe's own personality and conditions of the publishing industry were jointly to blame. Poe himself was a study in contrasts. Child at Eliza's bedside, boy at Jane's graveside, young gentleman in the wrong man's house, scholar, soldier, bellatrist, journalist, desk man, starving hack, Idealist, idolist, lyricist, luridist, humorous monkey, husband, liar, faker, infrequent, disastrous, tippler, lover, loser, lover, loser, desperate polymath, but never demoniac, and poet, 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 poet. Folks today think they know more than what folks used to know, and some of what they think they know is evil Edgar Allan Poe. 
Poe does connect to people on a gut level, and they want to they want to reach out and try to help him somehow, just as people did in life. I mean, people did want to help him. He did have friends, even though he annoyed most of them, many of them. When when he started getting these criticisms, when he started hearing that he was being portrayed as the ranting lunatic, which he sometimes could be. You know, if he had enough to drink, he would go a little crazy. If he, you know, got a little bit upset or he got offended, he would be very, you know, hostile towards people. And he was definitely a very harsh critic. He spoke very negatively about a lot of people. So I think that that side of him did exist on one hand. But people would paint him also very negatively because he was so mysterious, because people didn't understand him. But you have to kind of mix and mingle uh, Poe's real life with his creative life. The tension of his personal life, of being an outsider, wanting to be an insider, of being a southerner who wanted to break into the northeastern uh, literary circuit, of being someone who wanted security and wanted the, the, just to have a, a home because he'd been deprived of a home from jump, you know, from the beginning. He never had a place that he felt at home, for, except for that brief time with the Allens, and that was taken from him. With mounting debts, the author continued to churn out groundbreaking horror stories and lyric poetry, and in 1841 published Murders in the Rue Morgue, the first modern detective story. What set Poe apart from his contemporaries was that he wrote to entertain rather than to instruct. Poe spent all of his life, all of his productive professional life, writing like his life depended on it because, in fact, it did. Almost by accident, by the dent of the force of his will and working so much that he invents the, practically invents the short story, uh, the genre of science fiction, uh, detective fiction as we understand it today. Um, and, and just broke all these molds um, because he was writing so much. And yet I have made no money. I am as poor now as I ever was in my life, except in hope, which is by no means bankable. When he came onto the scene, the appetite for Gothic horror, romantic poetry, romantic literature was, of course, in its full Steam. People were really into these sort of fantastical themes and spiritual themes. But then when he took it a step further, people just loved that. People were afraid of it. And anything you're afraid of, you have that sort of morbid curiosity that you want to know more about. So I think that's really where his popularity came from, especially. People were entranced by it. They were both attracted and repelled by it at the same time. They, they weren't quite sure what they were going to get with him. His poems were just transcendent and, and lyrical and uh, then his, his fiction is, is dark and mysterious. His imagination wasn't just dark. He tried comedy, it just wasn't very funny. He also tried science fiction, detective stories, but these horror stories are really what caught on with the public. In deciding to write horror stories, of course, he turned to the basic human fears. You know, what kind of fears are they? Fear of being buried alive, of being suffocated, you know, finding yourself under the ground and unable to, to get up. Uh, fear of heights. Um, the, the fear that we ourselves are not really rational, that, that it's the rest of the world's okay, but we're not. And many of the narrators in his stories, in fact, that's one of the really clever things he does, are very rational. They're talking to us sensibly. Uh, and they're explaining themselves, and then as you get in the story, you find that they're getting ready to kill someone, they're getting ready to bury someone, and you say, wait a minute, this guy's not right. But you already associate yourself with him, and then to your heart, you find out he's, going, he's a psychopath. Why will you say that I am mad? The disease had sharpened my senses, not destroyed, not dulled them. Above all was the sense of hearing, acute. I heard all things in the heaven and in the earth. I heard many things in hell. How then am I mad? Hearken and observe how healthily, how calmly I can tell you the whole story. Edgar Allan Poe never killed uh, a beautiful woman or a benevolent man or even a cat. But his sin was, in the eyes of many, was revealing to 
us as individuals that we have these dark impulses, perhaps all of us do. And he just ripped the lid off and said, hey, look at that. There's something that people want to believe about Poe. I think his stories and his poems disturb us so much that we want to believe they could only come from somebody completely different from ourselves. People believed that Poe had seen these things or had done these things and so associated him with his narrator. People did things um, uh, in, in extremists uh, of the sort that Poe puts in his stories, but Poe didn't do them. Poe found them material for art. Uh, in fact, Poe is probably sitting at a desk writing most of his life, so he didn't have enough time to go out and have such an interesting life. Living in grinding poverty isn't fun. There's nothing enjoyable about it. It's not an adventure. It was an adventure every day just to get through the day in some phases of his life. In my last great disappointment, I should have lost my courage but for you. My little darling wife, you are my greatest and only stimulus now to battle with this uncongenial, unsatisfactory, and ungrateful life. In 1844, the family moved to New York City, where the following year he published the poem he's most commonly associated with, The Raven. It caused a sensation, yet earned him only $15, the most he ever earned for a poem. In the final year of his life, he read The Raven, I believe, 58 times. That was his hit. <laughs> and whether he liked it or not, that's what people wanted to hear. They didn't want to hear his new stuff, they wanted to hear his old stuff. <laughs> Do The Raven, man! It was like, you know, uh, the free bird of his, of his career. Deep into that darkness peering, long I stood there wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. This is from the raven at a point where he's absolutely terrified, but he hasn't seen anything yet. The raven hasn't actually entered the room yet. But this man is completely terrified of what could be there. He's just peering into the darkness, not even seeing anything out there. But it's his dreams, and he thinks that he's dreaming something that's more horrible than anybody could possibly imagine. That seems to be really what his literary career was about, was creating new dreams. And of course, sometimes those dreams are also nightmares. So he did you know, take us into the heart of the Spanish Inquisition, or sometimes he just took us down to the catacombs and sealed us up alive behind a wall. And he did write a lot about the death of a beautiful young woman. He said that was a theme most ideally suited to poetry because it was the most tragic. It's the one that would really touch people's souls in a way that no other theme could. The angels, not half so happy in heaven, went envying her and me. Yes, that was the reason, as all men know in this kingdom by the sea, that the wind came out of the cloud by night, chilling and killing my Annabelle Lee. That theme, familiar to him since childhood, that obsession, that nightmare, would visit him again in reality and usher in a new, more tragic chapter of his life. At the family's final home in Fordham, New York, Poe's wife died in a similar manner and age as his mother. Tuberculosis had once again robbed him. When Virginia dies, uh, this really sends him adrift. I think psychologically, uh, financially, although he, he's very he can, continues to be productive and, and inventive in his fiction, in some respects, I think that's where he retreated to. I mean, this is where at least he can control this. You know, I can write these stories and control this world and make it, as, and make it exactly what I want, even though the rest of my life... I mean, as an artist, he was magnificent. As a man, he was a mess. Poe continued in his search for stability, to no end, prompting a suicide attempt in 1848. All of his problems are right out there for us to look at. Um, and uh, I think there are people in our lives that probably remind us of somebody like him. Somebody we wish we could help, but can't. He was a pitiful guy in a lot of ways because, uh, and when I say pitiful, I, I mean that with great sympathy and empathy. He was emotionally needy, uh, but mainly he was financially needy. He needed to, to find enough 
security, financial security, so that he could live the life he had to live, and that was the life of a poet, the life, the life of a writer. He was in a, a never-ceasing quest for what we all want, a little bit of love and understanding, and, and for the most part, not finding it, um, not finding either of them. In the summer of 1849, Poe, weary from the disappointments that continued to plague him, yet optimistic about starting his own magazine, was in Richmond once again. He lectured at the Exchange Hotel and attempted to woo the fiance he had been denied in his youth, the widow Elmira Royster Shelton. By the time he came back, he had collected an unsavory reputation in some circles, and uh, uh, some of it was, was deserved, meaning he behaved irresponsibly here and there, uh, but a lot of it was not deserved, and some of it even then grew from people reading his stories as if the narrator were Poe. And I think Poe probably liked that kind of effect at times. He, he had a reputation as, as an important literary figure. And, and there would have been people who would have said, there's, there's the famous Poe. He was starting to sense that, like, uh, something of the fame, but none of the wealth that, <laughs> that we now associate with popular culture figures. Uh, he, was, uh, he was an outsider indie artist. The papers here are praising me to death, he wrote to Muddy, falling unconsciously into the heroic line, a couple of weeks before something or body X this eddy for real. Salvation would be, as always, a mothering angel, his own magazine. After giving readings, visiting old friends, and once again becoming engaged, Poe prepared to travel to New York and Philadelphia to raise money for his magazine and to bring Mariah Clem to Richmond to witness the marriage, neither of which would be. Then 40 years old, Poe took a steamer down the James and the events that followed constitute a plot twist worthy of one of his own tales. There is a little mystery involved because he was passing through Baltimore on his way from Richmond to Philadelphia and he disappeared for five days. No one knows where he was or what he was doing, um, who he was with. Basically all records of him just stop um, during that time. So um, when he turns up, it's under strange circumstances. He's found in the city streets of Baltimore. Um, he is wearing someone else's clothing. He is very sick, obviously very physically sick. He looks like he's been beaten. Um, he obviously has some kind of alcohol in his system. And as we know from looking at his past records, that's never very good for him. It makes him very ill and very incoherent and very, usually very violent. And he was carried to the hospital where he spent four days delirious and in and out of consciousness, talking to shadows in the wall. They gave him the diagnosis of encephalitis, which means the swelling of the brain. That's a very blanket term, basically saying we don't know what's wrong with him, so this is what we're going to guess is probably wrong with him. And then there stole into my fancy, like a rich musical note, the thought of what sweet rest there must be in the grave. The thought came gently and stealthily. And his last night on earth, he just woke up in the middle of the night screaming out the name Reynolds over and over again, but nobody knows who Reynolds was. And then he calmed down his last morning, and very early in the morning, he said, Lord, help my poor soul, and those were his last words. But Dr said that he died of congestion of the brain, which is a typical mid-19th century diagnosis, which doesn't really mean anything today. It could be a million things. So people come up with different theories about what could have been his cause of death, everything from rabies to a brain tumor. So he's just sort of been shrouded in that mystique since he's been gone. And it's appropriate for him, I think. I think that's also why no one's really work to find out what happened to him even in years later because people want to continue that legacy of intrigue and darkness. God have mercy on my poor soul, the recusant said on Sunday in homely prose, then finished his miserable days. His enemies claimed it was too damn little, too damn late, like the Richmond papers, condescending praise. When Edgar Allan Poe left Richmond that September, he left behind more than his bride-to-be. He left an indelible mark on literature and on our nation's psyche. 
The old stone house on Main Street, a building that Poe knew well, is where you can see some of the physical objects he left behind, where you can meet the man behind the mystery. There's very much a sense of his character and presence here. You know, Baltimore has his body, no one disputes that, and various towns argue about who should really lay claim to being Poe's place, but Richmond has his soul.